Welcome to Medscape. I'm your host, Dr. Andrew Wilner. Today, I have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Igor Koralnik to the program. Dr. Koralnik is the Archibald Church Professor of Neurology and Chief of Neuroinfectious Disease and Global Neurology at the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern Medicine in Chicago, Illinois. Today, we are going to discuss a relatively new medical challenge, a disorder that has been termed long COVID. Welcome, Dr. Koralnik. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting me on this uh, program. Thanks for joining us. To get started, please describe the phenomenon of long COVID. The general hypothesis that we have and others have as well uh, for the cause of long COVID, it's a, that is a new autoimmune syndrome, which it may be caused by persistent infection of the virus in hidden reservoir that leads to confuse the immune system that something is wrong with the, in the body that needs to be attacked. And the reason we uh, think this is the case is by, because 70% of patients who are not hospitalized for COVID-19 who come to see us in the clinic are women. We know that women are more likely than men to develop autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and so on. And that there is a higher prevalence of autoimmune diseases in the long COVID patient compared to the um, US population. In addition, we have seen patients developing autoimmune disease after developing long COVID at a time where there, that was not supposed to happen. For example, an 80 year old lady who developed, develops rheumatoid arthritis after you know, developing long COVID. As of today, I've seen more than 1,650 patients in my neuro-COVID clinic at Northwestern Medicine, and they all have neurologic manifestation of long COVID, which is also called post-acute sequela of SARS-CoV-2 infection, or PASC. About 15% of patients were previously hospitalized uh, in the, uh, with the severe pneumonia, uh, sometime requ uh, requiring intubation in the ICU, during which uh, they had a number of complications affecting their nervous system. And then when they come out of the hospital, they still have some neurologic problem of various sorts. However, 85% of the patient in the clinic never was hospitalized in, because of COVID pneumonia. They had a mild case of, uh, let's say, sore throat, a bit of cough, fever that went away, but thereafter devel develop those lingering and debilitating manifestation of long COVID, which include brain fog, headache, dizziness, problem with smell and taste, muscle pain, tingling, blurry vision, and ringing in the ears associated with intense fatigue. Those people who are never hospitalized uh, are usually female in their 40s, previously healthy, who did not have any uh, man, you know, major neurologic problem before uh, they developed those manifestations of long COVID. Wow. So I think it's easy to understand that if somebody's in the ICU and they have a stormy course, that afterwards they might have some sequelae. But it's a lot more difficult to understand that someone who just had mild symptoms and, you know, a flu-like illness that was COVID suddenly doesn't get better. And this lasts for months or longer? Certainly. So we opened the clinic in May 2020 during the lockdown in Chicago. And uh, we have seen patients who uh, developed those symptoms back uh, in the spring of 2020, who still have those symptoms. We ask patients who come to the clinic, how much percent recovered you are compared to before COVID? If you say 100%, you're back to normal. And um, uh, we see that some patients tend to improve quickly, especially if they only had disorder of smell and taste, who tend to improve faster. But if they have brain fog or headache, or other manifestation, these tend to last longer. Everybody tends to improve over time, but going on their own pace, and we can't predict based on a group, 
that uh, long COVID is only going to last for a certain period of time. Some patients still have long COVID more than two years after being sick in the first place, sometime with very mild illness. Now, I think there was... I don't know. I've definitely heard some talk that these symptoms, you know, they're kind of vague. I'm tired. I have brain fog. Is, is there any way to objectify these findings to, sort, to demonstrate that they're not just psychosomatic? Excellent question. And unfortunately, a lot of people who come to our clinic uh, tell us that uh, they've not been taken seriously by the medical establishment. Um, and uh, that those non-specific symptoms have been chalked to stress, you know, uh, especially during uh, pandemic time um, or psychosomatic issues, which is really not the case. What we do, we give patients a questionnaire, which are validated the patient reported outcome measure information system or promise questionnaire, asking them for their quality of life for their self-perceived uh, cognitive ability, fatigue, anxiety, depression, and sleep disturbance. And based on those validated measures that have been you know, uh, asked uh, to a very large number uh, of people in the US population, we can tell that their quality of life is worse than a US uh, normative population. Uh, for the same, you know, uh, questions, the same domains. Now, as a neurologist, my instinct would be if I were to see a patient like this to do a neurologic examination and probably follow up with an MRI of the brain and an EEG and maybe even uh, spinal fluid. What's the likelihood I'm going to find any abnormality that I can describe um, in these patients? Every patient who comes to the clinic, either in person or in televisit, has a one-hour appointment with us where we do a complete neurologic history um, and a complete neurological exam. And uh, in most cases, uh, especially in patients who are never hospitalized with pneumonia, the neurologic exam is unremarkable except for their cognitive dysfunction. Patients who have an MRI rarely have abnormal findings and uh, unless they were severely severely sick uh, sorry unless they were severely sick in the hospital with covid pneumonia intubated in the icu or they may be uh, older and had some other you know brain uh, issues prior to covid and uh, patients who uh, get a spinal tap rarely have abnormal finding on the CSF exam as well. And so we don't um, perform those tests routinely in our patient population. You mentioned the EEG. Uh, we only perform an EEG if we think that uh, there may be a risk of seizures, but uh, we haven't seen that in our long COVID population unless they had seizures before COVID. All right, well, Dr. Kralnik, I wanna push you uh, a little bit. Um, I. Uh, understand that there are objective cognitive findings on these various questionnaires, but isn't it true that these could also occur in patients who have depression, for example, that would have objective cognitive deficits? Certainly. And we ask patients if they had depression and anxiety before COVID, and we see that um, there is a higher prevalence of depression and anxiety in patients who are never hospitalized with COVID-19. 40% of them uh, uh, said that they had some depression anxiety before COVID, which is higher than the general U.S. population, whereas the rate of depression and anxiety is about 10% in those who were uh, hospitalized with COVID-19 pneumonia. So uh, this is something that is uh, relevant for this population of patients, but that still means that 60% of patients who come to see us never had depression and anxiety before COVID, and then they develop debilitating brain fog and the cognitive dysfunction that prevent them in their daily activity, and that can be being a, a, a nurse in the ICU, being a business person, managing hundreds of people, or being a teacher in high school, 
and uh, this is something that is real, unfortunately, um, and uh, that uh, leads to severely de decreased quality of life in those people and also uh, economic hardship as they are not able to function the way they were before COVID. All right. So given that, is there any way to prevent long COVID? For example, vaccination. You can still get COVID once vaccinated, and it's generally less severe. Does that help prevent the sequela of COVID? So we always encourage our patients to follow the guidelines of the CDC that says that should be vaccinated and boosted. Um, there have been some um, urban legends coming around saying that uh, vaccination either cures long COVID or either or otherwise makes long COVID worse. We have looked at that in our population of the, the first 100 patients who came to the clinic who are not hospitalized, and we follow them up you know, after the for a second visit, and we saw that vaccination did not do either, did not you know, cure long COVID or did not make long COVID worse. Um, we, on large population of uh, patients that have been studied, it looks like uh, long COVID which was occurring about 30% of people who survived COVID-19 before vaccination, uh, has uh, that vaccination or boosting has only decreased the incidence of long COVID by 15%. So that means that, you know, despite vaccination and boosting, you still have about 25% risk of developing COVID. It varies from population to population, obviously. Right now, we don't know what is the exact number of people who get infected because most people get diagnosed with the rapid test at home. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, vaccination boosting does not prevent long COVID. Uh, people can also get first, second, or third infection with COVID-19 and develop long COVID. And we see those patients in our clinic. Right. Let me follow that up with another question. Some patients with COVID get treatment with uh, Paxlovid or antibodies, does that seem to have any uh, relevance to whether they get long COVID or not? Well, you've heard about uh, cases of patients who got treated with Paxlovid and got, got, then got a rebound of uh, their COVID symptoms. Um, and uh, right now, you know, those patients have not been studied in uh, organized fashion. Um, you, you may hear about some cases who come to the clinic and, you know, they may be uh, interesting, but uh, they haven't been studied uh, uh, as a group. The National Institute of Health is currently organizing a treatment trial of uh, two weeks of Paxlovid for patients with long COVID. Um, and um, this is at the development phase, so we don't have you know any information based uh, you know uh, in addition that uh, the the trial is in the works. Now we do have treatments. We have many treatments for autoimmune disease. Is that something you would consider? So this is something that should be looked at. Um, if uh, long COVID is indeed an autoimmune disease. Uh, it would may be amenable to immunomodulation, but um, further research is needed. And I have an active basic science laboratory that is looking at those issues, uh, comparing the immune response of uh, long COVID patients compared to those who got COVID, got over it, and don't have any other symptoms, also known as asymptomatic COVID convalescent. And we see striking difference between the immune response against SARS-CoV-2 protein uh, in those two groups. Are you uh, still seeing patients in your uh, COVID clinic? Is that something uh, patients should consider? We are seeing between 50 and 70 new patients a month in the NeuroCOVID clinic, as well as in the Comprehensive COVID Center at Northwestern Medicine, which was created for the total care of patients with long COVID. This is a 12 specialty clinics these are 12 specialty clinics, including pulmonology, cardiology, GI, endocrinology, ENT, rheumatology, uh, psychiatry, and endocrinology, among others, uh, where we uh, have specialists in these different disciplines that are seeing patients with 
various, various complications of long COVID in their clinics since long COVID is a multi-system syndrome. Dr. Kralik, I think we're running out of time. Is there anything you'd like to add before we close? An important aspect is that at the people need to be aware that, uh, or, or physicians need to be aware that at the beginning of the pandemic in uh, the spring of 2020, uh, patients could not get tested uh, by nasal swab unless they were hospitalized in the you know hospitalized with COVID-19 pneumonia. And we estimate that about 10 million people in the US got COVID, got long COVID, but could not be diagnosed in time. And those patients uh, are uh, suffering just the same as the COVID positive long holders, but they get even more rejected and stigmatized. And since uh, those patients are mainly female in their 40s, it is really unfortunate. We see those patients in the, our clinic. We do not uh, request physician referral or a positive COVID test to come to see us at our comprehensive COVID center. And we take care of those patients just the same. They are just diagnosed with a post-viral syndrome, which, uh, but they are taken care of just the same as the COVID positive patients. Dr. Kralik, I want to thank you very much for uh, sharing your insights, experience, and research uh, with Medscape. I'm Dr. Andrew Wilner. Thanks for watching. <music>